Hello, my name is Phil Greenwood. I'm a lecturer at the Business School at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Weinert Center for Entrepreneurship. And this presentation is going to be a brief presentation on biotech entrepreneurship, incorporating several different things. Our agenda is going to include a brief overview uh, and specifically talking about some things pertinent to biotech entrepreneurship. Secondly, we'll discuss what I like to consider a, a few different illusions about entrepreneurship, mainly certain facts that exist, but also certain myths that exist. Thirdly, uh, we'll look at some factors that a lot of investors incorporate for ventures in general, but especially biotech ventures that make them attractive as potential investments. And then look at some things like after the startup uh, going into the future. So to start with, Biotech entrepreneurship, of course, has been really popular probably since the mid-1970s. I believe the first major biotech firm, uh, or one of the first, was Genentech out of the Bay Area and became very popular, uh, very well-known, developed a very successful product line early on, IPO, before they got bought out in the 90s or 2000s by Roche. Uh, followed by companies like Amgen and a few others. Uh, biotech companies, uh, biopharma companies, are unique creatures unto themselves. Uh, they, they face a heavily regulated environment, a very competitive environment, uh, a very global environment nowadays, and facing lots of, lots of different trends, lots of different uh, things going on in the world and, and domestically in the U.S. that have put a lot of pressure, but yet still create a lot of opportunity. And of course, in entrepreneurship in biotechnology, uh, because it's technology-based, there's always the pressure of new technologies that can leapfrog or replace current technologies. One of the things we like to talk about in our entrepreneurship classes in general, uh, especially in dealing with startups, is to provide kind of a a uh, brief overview on certain beliefs that a lot of the popular press has, and I think a lot of people have, to try to point out uh, realities of startups and such. Professor Scott Shane, who originally had done research at the University of Maryland and has recently been at Case Western Reserve in, uh, in uh, Cleveland, has written a book called The Illusions of Entrepreneurship. And what he really studies using economic data and survey data and a variety of other studies is to highlight what the uh, where the uh, you know what what's the what are some of the things people think are true about startups and small businesses but yet what's the reality as you can see here one of the things that Shane really points out and he says this is his number one myth or fact he he tries to to get across to entrepreneurs is it's really important that the success of a startup isn't totally reliant on the talent of the management team or the people involved, but that the industry has a lot to do with it. Um, starting a software company as opposed to a restaurant, the chance for success and big success is so much, is so much higher. And the same thing with a biotechnology firm, uh, depending if you're in drug discovery or research products or software, can really have a big impact. Shane also likes to point out that the average business, and remember, there's about 30 million uh, organizations which are classified as small businesses in America, less than 500 employees. Now, of that, about tw 25 million are people who are independent contractors, work on their own, or uh, don't have any employees. But the median startup that, that, the, uh, that is cited by Shane from research using census data the median startup is capitalized with about $25,000. Now, compare this to biotechnology companies. Many biotech companies are started with a small amount of money just to get, get operations started. But as we know, the cost of a biotechnology, biopharma company is a lot higher due to the regulation and all the technology involved. Initially, in the, in the beginning stages of a startup, the majority of the financing comes from the entrepreneur savings, including mortgages or second mortgages on their house, uh, relatives, a variety of other things. Also, it's important to know that business is, is typically either going
going to be a retail or a service business out of those 30 million, um, it's more likely it's going to be a hair salon or a clothing store than it will be, you know, a biotechnology or a software firm. Most founders of small businesses rarely expect to make more than $100,000 a year. And I know we like to point out that uh, people start businesses to make millions and so on and so forth, but that usually doesn't happen. It's usually not true. Uh, typically, uh, things most entrepreneurs go into business because they want to be on their own. Uh, yeah, they want to make money, but that's not the sole driving force. And finally, this is one point we try to get across with, with entrepreneurs. A lot of small business owners, entrepreneurs, depend, regardless of, of industry, don't like uh, the process of writing a business plan. They believe business plans are worthless, they take too much time, things change too much, and so on. Well, Shane has shown through his, his research that it really there is a lot of evidence that exists that performance measures of startups are improved if a business plan is written. Um, and he gives several different reasons, but mainly I think it's self-evident. You know, it provides direction to a company, uh, gets the company to analyze things, just adds a little more objectivity to it. Now, one of the, the, the stigmas or, or, or things that's associated with a small business is the fact a lot of them fail. In fact, the Small Business Administration estimates that of all industries, 60% of startups will fail or terminate within the first five years. Now, what are some reasons, and this is, again, regardless of industry, what are some reasons why this happens? Well, as we know, inadequate sales. They just never make enough money to create an income or to cover the expenses of the business. Secondly, and this is one reason that happens a lot, is a company has too much growth or too many sales. Uh, they're unprofitable, they can't control their expenses, a variety of things that go with that. Thirdly, regardless of the sales levels, they don't control their overhead or their operating expenses. They pay too high of salary, pay too much in marketing, whatever. Another reason for failure. Also, another reason that's, and if, this off, often ties into the first two reasons, is they have receivables dif difficulties, meaning they don't, uh, they don't collect from their uh, customers fast enough and uh, get, get in cash flow problems because of that. Another reason that is provided by the SBA and others is uh, that companies fail or terminate as competitive weakness. They just can't compete against stronger competition. Uh, either they don't identify it or they just never really figure out what the key success factors are. Companies that have retail or manufacturing uh, businesses that are those, Usually one of the reasons for failure can be inventory difficulties. Not just that they have too much inventory or too little, but they have the wrong kind of inventory. And, of course, when inventory in a lot of businesses is not being sold, that's money that's tied up there and leads to cash flow problems. For retail businesses especially, but this goes for all businesses, location can be a big uh, issue. There's been a lot of study recently about, you know, where you locate your firm if you're a technology-type business. Are you better off being in a Boston or a Silicon Valley, uh, especially in the biotech world where you have access to legal and all the talent and universities and such? Another reason, fixed assets. We, we spend too much money on capital uh, items like machines, like cars, like buildings. We spend too much on it and can't support it. And then the final reason given for failure in businesses in general or why small businesses only last a majority only last five years, is that gets neglected by management. They just don't spend the proper time with it. Now, something to note with all of these reasons, why we cover this is a majority of these reasons are definitely, they're not simple reasons, but they're easy to understand, and they can be influenced by management. Uh, there's a lot management can do to, to mitigate these chances and, and definitely stay in business. Now, what about biotech tech companies? How are they different? Now, in addition to those previous eight or ten reasons just given on the, the previous slide, there's also other things that biotechs have to, to consider, biotech startups. Uh, Dr. M. Kidgatheron, who is the founder of Altheos in the Bay Area, did a nice little presentation uh, at UC San Francisco not too many years ago and cited a lot of data uh, in, in his presentation about the biotech startup, biotech environment. 
Um, first, he noted that there's a general thought that biotech startups have about a 90% failure rate. Now, one thing to note is that's not within the, like the first five years, uh, but it can go as far as like 15 years where we'll find out whether biotech will actually succeed or not. Now, the bigger question is, okay, outside of being a normal business, why else might be a, be a reason for failure? Well, there's a lot of technology risk and uh, a lot of uh, issues faced with the clinical process, especially if you're in the drug development area where you have to go through the various phases of clinical approval. Uh, you have to you know, spend lots of money and also have to uh, you know, just wait your turn. You have to have a lot of expertise just to be able to do the clinical trials. Another reason he gave was just simply the time and cost of market. You know, typically 15 years to go through all the approvals, especially if you're going through the three phases and preclinical. And 2012, they estimated, I believe this is Tufts, Tufts University, updated their estimate to say that uh, to get a product to market, especially in drug discovery, was almost $2 billion. I'm sure that's higher now. Another reason why biotech businesses had a, have had a tough time, well, there's just less early stage financing from venture capitalists. A lot of venture capital funds have found, and their limited partners have found, that it's easier to put money into software companies or hardware companies where you don't have to face the regulatory approvals and don't have the incredible length of time to wait to see if the thing really works. And then finally, another reason that, that the Dr. Gotharun talked about was we've had tremendous change in our regulatory environment, especially with the Affordable Care Act. It's putting a lot of pressure, which isn't necessarily a bad thing for the consumer, but for companies, it's putting pressure on their ability to make profit, facing a lot more uh, price controls or potential price controls and just more emphasis on, uh, on you know, trying, trying to save money in the healthcare environment. Now, while failure and termination is a big idea to face, we, we do want to make sure that we focus on the opposite side of that of, okay, what happens if you have an opportunity, an idea, uh, uh, especially for a biotechnology startup, be it a drug discovery or whatever. One of the things we always like to get across in our entrepreneurship courses at the, uh, at the business schools is a quote from Albert Einstein. And, and in developing this idea, identifying the opportunity, building your business, we, Einstein once said, and not necessarily that it was applicable to biotech, but, but or that he was directly attributing it to biotech, but it kind of fits, is that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not more so. So there's a fine balance uh, in developing your opportunity in not making it too complex, but yet not cutting corners in order to make things work. When we start looking at, at new ventures uh, of all type, but especially in biotechnology, we really look at four general things. And this is a concept that was, uh, or a framework developed by uh, William Solomon, a professor at, at Harvard Business School in entrepreneurial management, entrepreneurial finance. He said basically there's a balance between four different areas for new ventures. One is the people and the resources, of course the team and the money involved and so on. Uh, secondly is the opportunity. Uh, you know, how big is the market and such. Thirdly is the deal. You know, how much money is going to be required? How much do we forecast that the, uh, the, uh, the investors will make or the company will generate in profits? And then in the middle of the context, the macro environment, the leg legislative items, trends that are taking place, uh, may many times outside the control of the company or outside the control of the industry, but Salman cites that we have to go through and balance all four of these in order to create, or at least to identify a solid opportunity. And when we write plans, when we present, uh, when we discuss investors, we've got to make sure that we hit all of these. Now, kind of a, a, a framework that I use in evaluating new venture opportunities is something called the Outside Impacts Approach. That's an acronym, believe it or not. The Outside Impacts Approach uh, is, a, is a framework that was developed by uh, Professor Stephen Kaplan out of the University of Chicago, who teaches in entrepreneurial finance and is, is a major leader of their new venture uh, creation, uh, business plan competition and such. He's developed this checklist that he sees as valuable, not only in teaching to potential entrepreneurs, but also he's found it to be very valuable when working with investors to teach them kind of a quick and dirty checklist to 
help uh, get through different, uh, help evaluate opportunities in a relatively quick basis. Now, you have to understand that with a lot of, especially venture capital funds, who ultimately are investors in biotechnology, a lot of biotechnology uh, businesses, they may look at 2,000 to 4,000 or more different proposals per year. Many times those funds don't have too many people and don't have the resources to spend lots of time in evaluating it. So what they need is a checklist or what we call a first cut feasibility tool to weed through those 2,000 to 4,000 opportunities and to help select uh, a good 10 or 20 different potential investments that they can perform further type of analysis. So let's just quickly go through some of the components of the outside impacts. Again, this is a this is a acronym, and as you can see, the seven major components of outside is to first look at the opportunity. Again, we'll we'll delve into this greater detail in the next few minutes, but one of the great things people have to identify with is is there an opportunity? and the items and the, the things that go with that. Secondly, we have to look at the uncertainty associated with the venture or idea and what, what, what steps can be taken to lessen the opportunity or the uncertainty in the opportunity. Thirdly, of course, the team. Fourth, the strategy that's being employ, employed by the company. Is it the right one? Fifth, the investment that goes with that. And the D is the deal structure that's associated with that. And then finally, what kind of exit opportunity uh, is available for the investors. And what Kaplan says is that all seven of these items have to be addressed and they should not have negative answers with them. So in other words, we should not have a negative response or a negative analysis associated with the team or any of the items. Uh, or if there is a negative, we uh, pass on the deal. Now, the most important part of the outside framework is the opportunity or the what we call the impacts associated with this. Again, think of impacts as an acronym. The I portion says what is the idea in the industry and what we're what they typically are asking is can the entrepreneur, can the team explain uh, the idea of the venture of the technology very clearly and concisely. But secondly, is it in the type of industry, is it in the same industry that we invest in? A lot of times, one of the quickest ways that investors will pass and not invest in a company is they'll simply say, you know, we're not, in, uh, we're not into the biotech space. We're only in software or, or vice versa. That will be one of the quickest ways they screen through opportunities. The second component of, of the impacts, which is tied to opportunity, is, you know, is the market large enough uh, to support substantial growth? In other words, you know, is this only a $50 million a year market or is it something that could ultimately grow to $100 million or $500 million or more? And is this an idea that might be able to get you know, 5 or 10% market share to create a sizable enough sales base for the company and profits along with it to support an investment in it? Secondly, you've got to look at within the, the market growth opportunities, not just the size and how fast it's growing, but also can it support evaluation? In other words, is this a profitable uh, market? that will be able to, if, if this company ever gets sold or if it ever goes uh, public, it can support a good stock price. The P portion is, you know, does it generate positive present value, not just in financial terms, but a unique value proposition for customers? Uh, has it been accepted in the marketplace or can you show that it's been accepted, um, not just through research, but trial and error and such? Uh, will the customers buy this? Again, in biotech, this might be a little bit difficult because you have to go through the, through the uh, preclinical and so on phases. Um, the C portion of impacts is, is there any chance that competition could come into this play? You know, is there a intellectual property that protects the technology? Or are you far enough ahead of competition uh, that you can protect yourself and the company won't uh, be put out of existence relatively quick? Is this a good time to enter for the company? Why now? Um, why hasn't this been done before? 
Uh, is it too early? Is it too late? We have to answer those questions. And then finally, associated with the opportunity is the S or the speed. How quickly can this be done? Now, in general, with non-biotech companies, they may be looking at a time frame of a year to three years. Can this be, you know, can the technology be implemented that quick? Um, or is it going to be something that takes too long for our investment horizon? Now, of course, in, in drug discovery, biopharma and such, uh, you might be talking a 10 or 15 year product development cycle. Well, can that be done on that length of time, but also can there be alternative, uh, at least can you show progress in the time horizon of the investors? Now, within the opportunity impacts portion, what Kaplan suggests is that all of the IMPA CTS has to be positive, or at least no negatives. If any of those items are negative or don't meet our criteria, then we, we say the opportunity is not one we're going to pursue, and we pass on it and go down to our next company. The second area within the op outside approach, outside impacts approach, is the uncertainty. One of the things that we have to identify is, okay, how certain we are, are we about the size that the market will become or that customers really will accept this? And in biotechnology, that's really tough because, you know, we have to try to look out 10 and 15 years into the future to see if people will really get at that. More importantly, though, is not just to identify the uncertainties, but are there steps that we can take to help manage it? Like, can we uh, align with certain customers who will work with us in developing the product? Um, are there types of investors, strategic investors, who can help offset some of the risk or provide, uh, you know, certain type of, of expertise? And, you know, how, how, how understanding not just what the uncertainties are, but what we can do to, to hopefully reduce the uncertainties, how, how is this going to affect the opportunity if, for instance, we find out the market size is going to be $50 million instead of $200 million? Do we still have a, a, a chance to make enough profit from an investment standpoint? So from uncertainty, you go to the team. I think we, we, people cover this a lot. You know, you look at the things like the previous experience of the team. Um, the thing I really look for, and I think a lot of people, a lot of investors do within a management team of a new uh, biotech ventures, how passionate are they? Are they hungry? Um, do they have, uh, you know, have they put a lot of time in this? Are they working 100% toward this venture? Uh, do they have some stock ownership or have they invested themselves? Um, and to realize that, yeah, it, we don't need to hire everybody right away, but what pieces will need to be added and what type of people will be uh, needed to fill those things? And, and is the company planning for that? So you've got opportunity, uncertainty, the team, the fourth and fifth component is the strategy. So are we, is the company have a strategy in place that's, is it aligned properly with the opportunity, the uncertainty, the team, and the exit? Does the team have the experience to implement the strategy? From the investment standpoint, you know, are they asking for enough or too little money? Believe it or not, it happens a lot where new ventures don't ask for enough money and it shows the lack of experience of the founders of the management team um, or if they don't ask they, they might be asking for too much and it goes beyond what the investors can handle uh, believe it or uh, believe it or not also that a lot of investors have a minimum threshold especially venture capital firms where they may say we have to put in at least x amount of million into a company to make it worthwhile otherwise it's too small for us to 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 manage in addition to the investment side of it um, you know, what about the cash flow forecast? Do they have a four pro forma cash flow forecast over three or five years? Do they make sense? Um, you know, if, if there's not going to be revenue right away, how are they going to manage their expenses to control them, you know, to make sure that they're spending enough to push the product along on the 15-year product life cycle, product development cycle in biotech, or, or not going to, you know, that, that, that they're making progress? So all those things are looked at. In addition, finally, Kaplan recommends that you look at the deal and the exit strategy. Um, with the deal, you're looking at what type of financing is it? Is it preferred stock? Is it a convertible loan that can be changed from a debt, you know, a loan into into equity? Is it common stock? Uh, are there incentives in place for the management team and the investors? So everybody's 
kind of going along the same wavelength. Um, is there government governance in place? In other words, you know, maybe there's a board seat that should be added to this investment, or or what is what is who is on the board, and how is the governance of the company managed? And finally, what's in place to manage the financial uncertainties, and especially in biotechnology, where we can talk incredible sums of money that need to be invested. Um, are are the investment are they are the is the management team asking for all the money up front? Are they splitting it up into chunks or tranches? Uh, do they have the ability to syndicate the investment? So bring in several investors, not just one. So all those things have to be looked at from a deal standpoint, not just the percentage ownership and the valuation. And then finally, the E is the exit. You know, is this going to be a company that can do a public offering, an IPO, or is it somebody who can be bought out, you know, merger and acquisition, or is it going to be something that's just not big enough that it'll ever want to exit, or maybe the entrepreneurs who start the company don't want to go through a, a sale or an IPO. All those things have to be hashed out and are part of, an important part of the deal. So in the end, Kaplan recommends that investors, uh, if, if, if all the items, the O-U-T, S-I-D-E, don't come out positive, or at least there's no negatives, if there's any one of those negative, they pass on the deal. In other words, they leave it outside. Other things that biotech or venture capitalists will look at in biotech ventures is what we call the 10x factor. Um, can they put money into this company and in five to seven years get 10 times its money back? Also, things you want to look at is the founder's dilemma. In other words, people who start these companies be aware of what happens to their role in the company as time goes on. Now, the 10x factor, all it really says is, can we get 10 times our investment back? In other words, for instance, if we put in a million dollars in a company this year, uh, five years out, can we get $10 million out of it? In other words, when they sell the company, when they uh, do the IPO with the percentage of stock that we own, you know, can we get that much money back? Now, wh why this is important is that a lot of times investors don't talk in terms of we want to, in saying things like we want a 15% return on our investment or we need a 15% IRR. In other words, typically they'll say we want a 5x or a 10x return. Well, it's important to note that that's what they want and that's what they mean, but also it also points to if they can get a 10x return in five years without having to invest any more money, that's about a 60% annual rate of return. And for a lot of people, a lot of, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs who haven't been dealing with venture capitalists very much, this is kind of when they hear that, that equalized interest rate or ra internal rate of return, it tends to set them back a little bit to think people need that kind of return on their investment. Isn't that a little high when you, I can go to my bank and get a f loan for 5% or, you know, relatives will, will invest and only want like 10 or 15% annual rate of return. Um, but there's a reason for that. It's because people in the venture capital uh, industry, typically in a fund that they have, will, will invest in about 10 to 15 companies. And historically, out of their fund, uh, usually only one or two uh, of those investments will actually make money. In other words, be home runs. So they have to use some big threshold to try to identify what attractive investments are because even after they make the investment, because every company they'll have in their portfolio will have passed this 60% annual rate of return or at least the potential for a 10x return, only one or, one or two of them will actually generate that. The remaining 80% will either lose all their money or most of the money or maybe just return the principal to them. And what's critical for investors, especially in biotech companies, is they need a liquidity event. In other words, the company better plan to do an IPO in five to seven years or better plan to be uh, sold to a larger biopharma company or something. And if they don't plan for that or it, it's not in the cards, that makes it a less attract attractive event less attractive investment. Secondly, when talking about the 10x factor, 
investors get very concerned about are they going to need a lot more investment money after they make their original original investment and will that dilute down their percentage ownership because what will really drive the value of their investment is not only the overall value of the company but what percentage they own of that if the company needs additional lots of financing and the investor can't put much more in after their initial chunk that they invest in they could get reduced down to a very small uh, percentage ownership and really decrease their chances for getting a big return on their investment. A third thing that comes into play with this 10x rule or, or, or criteria is that it really shows companies, especially in biotech, pharma, biopharma, they have to be in markets that have really large potential market values or market potential. In other words, they better be in industries that might be able to create like a that, that the overall market will be a billion dollars in sales at some point in the future and that this investment whoever owns it will be able to get a good chunk of that so all these things come into play now a second thing that biotech entrepreneurs should really be concerned with is what something we call the founders dilemma the founders dilemma was a framework a concept developed by a Noam Wasserman, who was a professor at the Harvard Business School, now he's at a University of Southern California. In his research in the late 1990s, early 2000s, he studied uh, high technology companies and who, who eventually did IPOs, initial public offerings, and wanted to find out what happened to the management team as these, as these startups moved along and eventually did the IPOs. He analyzed a few hundred different startups in the U.S. Uh, he found, one of the key things he found and why he called it the founder's dilemma is that by the time ventures were, the, these ventures were three years old, 50% of the founders of the companies were no longer the CEOs. In other words, investors had either fired them or they had moved them into a less, into a position with less authority. Even in year four, only 40% were still in, in their corner office, or 60% were gone. And then, typically after the IPO, which happened after the fifth year, only 25% of the founders remain. So ultimately, Wasserman's found that four out of five entrepreneurs typically are forced out by investors from their CEO post. He also found as part of his research, and, and also this is uh, correlated with other researches and a couple other journals, is that usually entrepreneurs, even in high tech, biotech companies, never make as much money or make just as much money as the employees that work for them. So the misnomer that entrepreneurs who start biotech companies are going to be millionaires and billionaires someday is typically not right. Wasserman showed in other research of 528 companies that over half of the entrepreneurs made less than at least one person who reported to them. And so things to conclude out of this is that typically founders are probably in biotech companies that receive outside investment and are going to go down the path of an IPO or an acquisition. Most founders are going to be pushed out of their job. Secondly, they're not going to make a lot of money. Additionally, what Wasserman tried to identify what, what the problem was, he said most entrepreneurs were too over, overconfident when they started their company about what their process, prospects were. They were way too confident in that they would be able to stay CEO regardless of what happened and be able to manage the business into the long term. Now, Arnie Cooper and other researchers at Purdue University uh, correlated this, this research by asking 3,000 entrepreneurs about what they expected of their future prospects. 81% were confident of their own success and that they would stay with their company, and over six, almost 60% were, were confident of success in similar ventures. So in other words, most entrepreneurs, especially in the biotech space, tend to be overconfident and not realistic about what their role will be in the long-term long -term venture. Now what Wasserman recommended and what he, part of what he concluded from his research is that 
investors and entrepreneurs must realize that there is a control versus wealth trade-off. Typically, companies that made that had higher value and also the entrepreneurs were able to stick around long enough, the entrepreneurs had to face the what they called the rich versus king or queen trade-off. In other words, did the entrepreneur just want to be wealthy and want the company to be wealthy, or was control the major issue? Did the entrepreneur want to stay, you know, in control of the organization? What Wasserman found out is that the entrepreneurs who tended to be less control-oriented and were more, more concerned about creating wealth for themselves and, and everybody associated with the venture, they tended to succeed and, and the, the venture tended to do well uh, after the IPO or better in the IPO. He also found that investors use uh, a lot of mechanisms to, uh, through control mechanisms to make sure that they can maximize their wealth. In other words, things like putting together employment agreements for uh, CEOs or being on the board of directors and such. And then finally, as part of the financing agreements, that's where this is typically decided uh, when doing investments. So that's kind of a brief overview of, you know, just some things about entrepreneurship, uh, a little bit of data on biotechnology entrepreneurship, and then some research that's happened after the fact, what investors look for, uh, dilemmas that are faced by founders in firms, including biotech firms, and, and, and other things associated with uh, what happens after a biotech startup uh, moves along the development path, receives money, and, and so on.